Hello, I'm Emily Rhodes. Thank you so much for joining me to talk about da -da 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 -bum -bum. Da -da -da A Fortunate Man by John Berger. He wrote the words and Jean Moore, he took the photos. And the book's about the fortunate man of the title is this guy here, Dr. John Sassel, um, as he's called in the book. His real name was Dr. John Eskel, I think. Um, yes, I think that's right. Anyway, this book is about a doctor, a country GP in the 1960s in the Forest of Dean, which for those of you who don't know, is a very rural England. It's absolutely fascinating because I think, you know, medicine and doctors are, are, is something that is in everyone's life, right? I mean, maybe some of us are doctors or have got relatives who are doctors, but I think everyone has been either a patient or the child of a patient or the parent of a patient or the, you know, a friend of a patient. We we all know, um, we've all experienced in some way the the kind of presence of a doctor, the, the relationship with a doctor, the power of a doctor. And it's really interesting to see how that has maybe shifted and, and developed and changed um, since the 1960s, um, yeah, kind of comparing today to the 60s and and what what being a country doctor was like then. Um, in our walking book club and our Zoom book group, um, it was really lovely to to hear some people's own experiences of, you know, their relationship with doctors in the 60s, and and it felt very that this rang very true to what it had been like. Um, this kind of cradle to grave service. Um, although in some ways I, we felt he was quite ahead of his time with the, the psychotherapy in the evenings. One thing to mention is that really sort of devastatingly after this book was written, the doctor killed himself. Um, and, you know, I think that's something that's very much in in the sort of public eye today, the, the suicide rate among doctors is really high. Um, so perhaps a bit more, perhaps one of the flaws of this book, because I think this is a flawed book and we all had a lot of kind of quite feisty criticism of it. Um, I think one of the things is perhaps not quite noticing the strain that the doctor was under. So how, how can I talk about this bit to you? So I'm going to just quickly show you the, the sort of structure. So it's a collaboration between John Berger, who was a brilliant writer and kind of art historian, cultural historian, he was, he was a Marxist um, critic, and Jean Moore, who was a, a wonderful kind of documentary photographer. So there are a lot of these beautiful photographs. Here are some of the ones that are more kind of landscapey. And then there are lots of the doctor himself and his patients. Um, Uh, here we go, there's one of Dr. Um, some more. Here's kind of, that's quite a good one, him treating a patient. Um, so the text is very much in conversation with the photographs to, to build up a, a sort of fuller portrait of, of his life and practice. Um, it begins with kind of setting the scene. There are a few um, landscapes and actually the first few pages, literally there's just a sort of tiny amount of text and, and mostly photograph. And then we get this kind of series of case studies which come kind of thick and fast. And to me, they were so gripping and really pulled us into, into the situation, into getting to know the people, how they interact with the landscape. I mean, quite dramatically, the first story, the first case study is about a man who gets trapped underneath a tree, a forester who gets trapped underneath a tree. Um, so you literally see how the landscape is really, literally Im impacting their lives. Um, there's another one about a, a young woman who's kind of very depressed as, or sort of dissatisfied with her life. Um, there's one about a woman who's this instant has had a kind of physical effect on her, even though it's a psychological 
sort of situation. So that was quite interesting. There was one about a, a woman who was very worried about her husband. Um, they're kind of all they have. They're old, um, quite isolated. Yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's great. They're great, these short stories. Well, I call them short stories. They're, to me, that's what they felt like. Very short, short stories, kind of flash fiction. Um, these little vignettes of case studies. And then it's as though he's kind of lured you in and sort of tricked you into thinking you're going to be reading this book of case studies. Because then he, then John Berger really starts on delving into this, these great philosophical big ideas about how a doctor works and what is the meaning of his practice. And I think he means that both specifically with John Sassel and also more more generally, you know, what is a doctor? What is his role in society? And as some of you might know um, <laughs> from my other webcasts and book groups, I love a good novel and I also enjoy a kind of gripping memoir or biography or some kind of narrative nonfiction. But this kind of book, I would say it pushes me quite out of my comfort zone. Um, I couldn't read it in the bath. I couldn't read it on the sofa. I couldn't read it in a cafe. I had to sit down at my desk with a pen and notebook and take notes um, in order to get my kind of creaky old brain um, around some of these ideas or even to try and just begin to wrestle with them. So I really relished the challenge and the workout and the change. But I would just say this is not for someone who just wants a kind of easy read. It's it's one that really demands quite a lot of brain power to, to really get the most out of it. Although it's thin, I think you do really have to sort of fully engage that brain. It's like, I don't know, cycling up a very steep hill. <laughs> it's like short, but quite painful. But, you know, you feel great when you get to the top of that hill. So there's not time here to talk about it all. Um, there are a couple of ideas that I want to to try and go into, and I'm going to start by reading out a very short paragraph. It's on page 148, which to me, this feels like the kind of crux of the book. Sassel is nevertheless a man doing what he wants, or to be more accurate, a man pursuing what he wishes to pursue. Sometimes the pursuit involves strain and disappointment, but in itself it is unique. It is his unique source of satisfaction. Like an artist or like anybody else, he believes that his work justifies his life. Sassel, by our society's miserable standards, is a fortunate man. So perhaps just from those few sentences, you get a bit of a feeling of what the prose is like. You know, it is thick with ideas. There's so much to unpick here. Um, so do we think Sassel is a fortunate man? And or does this thing of saying by our society's miserable standards, does that completely undermine saying he's a fortunate man? How does that make us feel about our own lives? Would you say you are a fortunate man or woman? Are you spending your life pursuing what you want to pursue? Um, does the strain and disappointment involved in that pursuit, does that detract too much from the unique source of satisfaction that it brings? So there's a lot to think about. This idea of pursuing what you want to pursue, this kind of pursuit of knowledge, is a big thing in the book. And there's this kind of metaphor that kind of he comes back to again and again where he compares Sassel to one of Conrad's mariners, this sort of authoritative, strong figure who's going to adventure out to sea and kind of master the storm. Um, and I think in this spirit of, you know, going off to sea, that is the kind of idea of pursuing knowledge um, in this instance. So the way so, oh God, it's so complicated to talk about. This. The way he pursues his knowledge is, of course, in the lie in treating all his patients. And so another really big idea in this book, which I think is spot on, is the way Berger writes that 
the doctor recognises his patients. And that is kind of his key role for them, is really important in his treatment of them, is just recognising them as people. And so in doing that, he, you know, he names the illness so that rather than just being, you know, a, a person consumed with this illness, kind of taken over by it, by giving the illness a name, it's like, a, it's a sense of separating yourself from it, you know, being able to control it, being able to fight against it and separating the person away from the illness, which I thought was so interesting and and helpful. Um, in his, in his recognising of the patients, Sassel kind of reflects back to them who they are. And Berger argues that this process of recognition, while it's very helpful for the patient, it's also helpful for Sassel because that's because all the patients are so different in kind of trying on all these different roles and mirroring all these different people back to them. That is his way of kind of pursuing knowledge for sort of going out to mastering the sea. Um, and I thought that was interesting that, that through this process of recognition, Sassel is kind of pursuing the universal, the, the sort of Renaissance man who, who gets to try everything um, and all these different people. So I thought that was interesting. The other um, thing that was especially interesting to me was the way he writes about time. He talks about time as being experienced very differently by a child as it is to an adult, which, you know, anyone who has children would totally agree with. Um, in particular, he talks about it in reference to when an adult is in a state of anguish. And he says that when we cry or in, a, or in anguish like that as an adult, we become childlike again. It's as though we regress to a childish state. So there are these photos of anguished adults. And you can see there really is something very childish in the way they look. He talks about their body language, kind of adopting the fetal position. And he, he brings us down to this point that when you are a child, time is experienced as a series of losses. And he means that because... Yeah, because because for children, you're constantly ending things. You know, they they don't yet realise that you're going to watch a film again another day or have another breakfast the next day. Or, you know, it just feels like the end of everything is an awful loss. And it's very hard with children to kind of move them on to the next thing. And I, I completely agree. It's, it's really hard to sort of finish breakfast and get them dressed or, you know, whatever it is. Moving on to the next stage is really hard. But for a child, you're, they're very easily comforted by the beginning of the following stage. You know, they get over their tears that they haven't been able to finish their toast because there isn't time um, by the fact that they're suddenly kind of walking to school and, you know, you're on to the next thing. As an adult, your life isn't broken down into these sort of minuscule parts. You're just sort of living. It's just sort of the day to day. You don't really experience these sort of schisms and divisions between each, the schism the right word? I don't know, sort of chasms, gaps, these, these big differences from one part of the day to the next, or even from one day to the next, you're just kind of living. And you know, the flip side of this is it can be quite boring and maybe you lose that sense of adventure but you don't endlessly feel loss until you are in a state of anguish when you do experience a terrible loss and then you kind of go back to that childish state of loss only the the sort of terrible irony is you can't be comforted easily in the way that a child can because there isn't an easy new beginning you know if you're dealing with grief or or some other sort of terrible news it's very hard to get past that and to find the new beginning. So anyway, I thought this was a really powerful idea. It is a flawed book. There is a lot we can take issue with and argue with, but I think it remains absolutely fascinating. And I think sometimes a book that provokes so much is, um, you know, it's wonderful to feel so strongly about, about something. I'm just reaching for my next book. This is December, A Touch of Mistletoe by Barbara Commons. 
it's, re it's really good. <laughs>